Outstanding. Well, this is Nicholas Hoffer von Heidi with the Euphonium Summit for Farm for Dreams being recorded with Don Palmeyer. Palmeyer, close. Palmeyer. Awesome. And uh, I am looking forward to this. As I was just discussing with him, he's one of the major foundations to my journey of joining the military band system. So with further ado, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, for having me on. And uh, yeah, so just my background, I, I did four years uh, out of high school in the uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot Band at Paris Island, South Carolina. So I did my Marine Corps boot camp training first. Um, I was, uh, shall we say, um, faked out by my Marine recruiter because my dream was to be a member of the president's own. He said, well, if you want to be in the president's own, you need to go in the Marine Corps first. So I did. And that didn't work out so well. Um, I did audition twice while I was in the Paris Island band and almost made the finals once. Got out, went to school, almost graduated, and then won the audition in 1986 in the President's Own. Spent four years and seven months in the President's Own. Um, left, got my master's degree, auditioned for Pershing Zone, spent 22 years and five months there, retired as Principal Euphonium. Um, and then in 2018, I auditioned for the Royal Hawaiian Band in Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, became the Principal Euphonium there and stayed there until 2021. Um, and then in 2021, I became the, uh, well, what I am now, the teaching professor of euphonium at East Carolina University. So that's that's kind of it. That's awesome. Do you have any big recitals or uh, concerts that are on the docket for this semester coming up? I have a, a recital a solo recital at the end of November. I think it's the week before Thanksgiving. I'll be doing a full recital. Um, so that will be exciting, I hope. Are Should there be. any uh, spoiler alerts of uh, what to expect from your recital? Like what pieces? I'm going to be doing a bassoon piece. Um, the Horvitz? Accordion piece. No, no. Um, and then I'm going to do Wait, you said accordion? Uh, yeah, an accordion piece, a Zybo Kekos from the Wilby Concerto, um, and a um, few others that I'm still trying to nail down, trying to do an eclectic thing. Um, when I rec when I recorded my, my solo CD back in 2013, um, I didn't record any pieces that were written for Euphonium. It was all, they were all pieces that were uh, written for other instruments other than my one brass and percussion piece I actually had a, a colleague of mine write it for me but everything else was written either for guitar or um, for for a harp or for voice or for flute um, so uh, so yeah so just I like doing things other than euphonium might be kind of weird coming from a euphonium player but no not at all actually we, we have to, we have to actually admit that the greatest music that has been written has not been written for euphonium. It's been written for other instruments. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, we need to be willing to transcribe those pieces, even if it makes our pianists have to play in keys they're not used to, especially if they know that repertoire, they're just going to have to learn how to play it in a, maybe a more awkward key than what they're used to. Indeed. So. Oh, by the way, uh, before I forget, Adam says hi. Oh, great. Very so, nice. Anyway. I should have said that beforehand, but I was just thinking, uh, this is so surreal for me to be able to interview you, uh, interview our community and those that have walked the path and blazed the trail for Euphonium's uh, current and future. And so uh, definitely with the uh, Euphonium pieces or even the reason why I reminded myself that Adam says hi is he dives into clarinet pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never really considered that. Even as a librarian in the army band that I was stationed at, I never considered going into that. Uh, so that's that's really amazing. 
really yep. looking forward. I've had I, I had a colleague of mine. I used to uh, to do the uh, Music for All Summer Symposium when I was a Yamaha performing artist, and had a, a a colleague of mine that taught Illinois State when it was still there, and she's the flute professor there, and we we all as faculty had to perform a faculty recital, and one one particular day she actually performed the Demersman solo D concert that I ended up recording on my CD. And she got done performing that piece and she came off the stage after the recital and she walks up to me and she goes, you know, that would be a great euphonium solo. And I said, I was thinking the same exact thing. And then I ended up recording it. So I agree with Adam, um, clarinet pieces, saxophone pieces, flute pieces work really well on euphonium. Sometimes you just have to worry about changing the register a little bit. Um, but normally you just have to change keys. Um, like I, my, uh, I did the Claude Bowling suite for flute and jazz piano trio on my CD. I, I transcribed the complete six movements, um, and changed the keys, got permission by from Claude Bowling to, to transcribe it, wow. um, to where it would lay well. Um, and, and it, it worked fabulously well for euphonium. That, and and he's very he was very pleased when he heard the recording and thankfully he was able to hear it before he passed but yeah you just you you listen to good music and you go you know i play euphonium but i want to play great music right and and i teach that with to my students as well i don't i don't just necessarily say well you just have to play all euphonium works right make it your own no exactly. matter what it is mm -hmm. cuz people have to listen to it Right. And if it's great music, the audiences are going to really enjoy the performance. That's I'll leave brilliant. it at that. And let people read between lines or whatever they might want to do. A absolutely. So when did you start playing euphonium? I actually started playing euphonium in the 11th grade. I started out on cornet and uh, had not such a great embouchure, went through an embouchure change. By the, lo by the local trumpet professor at the, at the community college, and it did not go so well. So I went from being first chair trumpet, all state trumpet player, to not hardly being able to play much, very much higher than a tuning concert B flat. And uh, I saw a euphonium and I thought, man, I want, you know, that's the same fingering. Maybe I can try that. And once I picked it up, there was no turning back. And I fell in love with it. That's amazing. So who's your, um, I know the questions are now, now it's, when did you first start taking private lessons? Well, funny. Not on trumpet, not on that, not from that junior uh, college professor. Yeah. You know, I, my first euphonium lesson wasn't until I got to the, um, the Navy school music. That was my first lesson. Oh, so that's right. Navy you went to Little Creek too. Yep. Yeah, so that was my first lesson. Um, I, you know, knew how to hold it, but at that, you know, I got to the school of music. I could only read treble clef. I had started trying to figure out how to read bass clef, um, but that was really when I took my first lessons. Um, and you know, when I was a kid, I when I was in junior high, I took a couple lessons again with a trumpet player who was a college student for a summer, maybe a handful of lessons. And then a few lessons with the junior college professor, you know, in 10th grade. And that was it. So, I mean, everything I did, I did it on my own. So whatever I learned, I learned on my own and just practiced as hard as I could. That's incredible. So you said you were an all-stater for trumpet. Uh, how did you fare on euphonium for your senior year? I didn't audition for Allstate on my senior year. I did, I did go, um, I did get, you know, a one, a superior in, in district on my solo. And then I was going to go to state and about a week before state solo uh, contest, I got chicken pox. Oh. Uh, so, and I got it bad as you would imagine as an 18 year old. Um, so I, I couldn't go. So it was like, well, sad, but, Life goes on. Indeed it does. Indeed it does. So when did you first uh, realize that you really wanted to pursue uh, euphonium as a dream, as a dream job career? I think it was 
close to about the time I went through the embouchure change, it was probably 10th grade or so. I, I, I don't even know how I heard about the president's own, but I thought, you know, I, I, they're the best band in the land. I've just mm -hmm. got to figure out how I, how I need to get in that band. And I just wanted to be there. And it was, it was an obsession and thankfully it worked out, but, uh, and I've met many, many people in my life that had that dream and it didn't work out. And I'm very, very fortunate. There's only, I think I'm, I was the 45th euphonium player in the president's own since 1798. And when you think about, you know, only being 45 euphonium players since that year, that's pretty remarkable. Um, it is. And, and so I'm very thankful that I had my time there in the band. It's definitely a time to be celebrated and honored. Absolutely. So when did you first start um, putting scales and arpeggios, long tones? You know, what professors and those who have been in uh, playing their instruments for a little while, part of your foundation of your warm-ups? You know, kind of embarrassingly, I was probably no different than most college music majors who barely did the minimum on the scale work in college. You know, you had to get past that barrier, you know, just get through those scales. Mm -hmm. And I never really understood, honestly, the value of scales until later, much later, even in my professional career. And the and the more the more colleagues I talked to we all agree that, man, if we had it to do all over again, we would have learned our scales so much better at a younger age. Um, you know, especially the sharps, the sharp keys, just the ones, the ones that the band directors never really pushed us to learn. Um, B major. Yeah. All, you know, <laughs> all, the, all the, all the scales that have the cross fingerings and, and everything that, you know, that, or that would, you know, utilize the fourth valve, mm -hmm. um, you know, the B naturals and the E naturals. Um, so I've really come to appreciate the scales. And I, I have been after, after my, my, I, I just had my first, my first uh, sophomore go through his barrier um, this past spring and he, he passed with flying colors. And I remember last fall, looking at him the first lesson and saying, okay, you know that we have to do all three forms of the minor scale mm -hmm. by spring. He's like, yeah. And so I had him play them every single lesson before we did anything else. And, and he got through them. He did well. Um, and, and now I, I just have to keep him now that he's got them, uh, doing them regularly. One of my colleagues found this really great app that I, that I, that I'm going to use that I set up. And once I find it, where did it go? Oh, it's, it just hit me that this would be, oh, it's called tiny decisions. Huh. And, uh, and I I've called it scales of fortune. I don't know. Can you see it? Or is it it's, it's that, no, it's the, uh, it's the virtual background that's blurring it out. Put it against oh. your shirt. It might work. There we go. There you go. And so it's like wheel of fortune and you hit you hit it and it spins and it'll right. stop at a certain scale. Like the circle of fifths, but better mm -hmm. and more color. But I but I put, you know, I put all every scale like that one ended up being G natural minor. So I put all three forms of all 12 of the scales in there and all the 12 major scales. So you got all 12 major scales plus all, all the minor scales, plus the three forms, and you just hit the spinner. And so I can just do a random thing and say, okay, this is what you're going to play next. So they can't say, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're just picking on me or whatever. No, it's like, that's what, that's what the Tiny Decisions app says. So is that, did you create that for your own profile or for your students? It's, well, it's, it's just called Tiny Decisions, but I, I forget what it looked like originally, but you can, totally edit it the way you want right so it does all the spinning and everything so i just went in there and typed all the scales in 
And then, you know, you just hit it and hit it and it just keeps on coming up every time with a different scale, which is That's cool. cool. That's very so, cool. But so, you know, that'll be the type of thing that I'll use with my students as they progress. Especially for the benchmarks. Right. This And especially, you know, keeping those, those minor scales going. So. That's really yeah. incredible. Um, so as far as your routine goes and how you're implementing that within your this new stage that you've uh, been in post-service, what, what kind of routines do you help your students establish uh, either pre-routine to their warm-ups uh, or just their entire practicing? Uh, how do you go about setting their, setting them straight on a, getting their bearings correct uh, as far as our military terminology goes? A lot of people don't understand that terminology though. I I try to I, I've tried to offer them various approaches to what some of us would call warm ups mm -hmm. slash daily routines. I'm a big I'm a big fanatic of daily routine and and intertwining the warm up. I mean, five minutes if you're in any kind of shape, you'll be warmed up. But post that post five minutes is where the chops I think really become feeling much, much better. And especially if you have a long rehearsal or whatever, a long performance, then you, you want to really lay a solid foundation. So I offer them um, various warm up, you know, long, long tongue exercises, whether they're the, the Arnold Jacobs warm ups or whether the Chris Olka things or whether um, whether there's some other different variations of those, um, Chickowitz, um, and then also the lip slur variations and, and try to, and I try to help them develop a baseline of, of what they should do, you know, long tones of some sort, lip flexibilities, tonguing, range exercises, um, range exercises, again, I, to me, I think one of the greatest uses of, of our scales, especially major scales and or chromatics, is range building. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking uh, with Rich Madison when he was still alive um, at the, the iTech that I went to in 1986. Yeah, I asked him, I said, how did you develop such a great high range? And he looked at me and grinned. He said, scales. I said, what do you mean? He says, I play scales, multiple octaves, up and down, slurred, crescendoing up, decrescendoing down. He goes, that's what, what I develop. And so what I teach my students is I say, the reason why scale slurred scales work so well in developing the upper register is because you're, that the aperture development happens very minutely as you work through the scales, instead of just working arpeggios, arpeggios in my mind don't really help work on um, the upper range because the you know the aperture changes depending on what register you're in. Whereas if you're going up and down, the the aperture, it, if it had a brain, it would be learning how to adjust from being quite open to very small as it goes up high. And comes down low so you know doing doing the scale work up and down to to develop that upper register so that's kind of those are the key components i work with with my students that's awesome so just to kind of circle back on a vocabulary word aperture uh, for the beginners or uh, family members that are watching uh, this uh, from now on um, the aperture is basically the little hole that the the buzz, the noise comes out of between the exactly. lips of the student or, you know, the the family members can actually join in with this. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of really awesome benefits on working the your aperture and the facial construction around here. Right. So, but, so you know, young, young students just don't need to be spending a, an inordinate amount of time thinking about aperture. Right. Um, because I, I fear too often that we can become, you know, we can, we can go into the paralysis 
by analysis because mm -hmm. we can start thinking, oh no, my aperture is not right. Well, the aperture, I, I'm a firm believer that if if everything is working correctly, we don't have to think about things. Right. If, if, if we're using our air properly, the embouchure is going to buzz. And that's why I so believe um, Arnold Jacobs teaching, you know, he, he, he was such a proponent of basically, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. He did. He, he would never from every story I've ever read, any account I've ever learned of, he never changed anyone's embouchure. He believed that as long as the air was working fine, mm -hmm. the lips would vibrate. And, you know, we, we have evidence, we, we've got decades of evidence of looking at great brass players' embouchures. When you look at an embouchure, you go, oh, that looks really good. Then you look at another one, you go, oh, man, I don't even know how that guy can play. And then you'll look at another one and go, really? That's mm -hmm. interesting. So, so yeah, we, we just need to make sure everything is set up properly and just no. trust that the teacher, if things need to be fixed... Trust in the teacher. <laughs> That's really awesome. I think, um, yeah, I, yeah. So what what equipment did you first have when you started playing on the cornet or and or euphonium? Because, I mean, a lot of that equipment's the same. So, you know, what did you first start using? Yeah, I, I don't even want to give, I don't even want to tip my hat to the trumpet players because that just make their heads bigger. So right. we'll just go right to the euphonium world. Um, I, I I want to say that I probably, the band, yeah, the band had three, three Yamaha 321s. Um, and I remember telling my parents, you know, my parents loved the fact that I had played trumpet. That was like bragging rights to them. And when I told them that I was not going to play trumpet anymore, they didn't like it. And when I told them that I wanted to get a euphonium and that I needed to get a euphonium, what did they do? But they bought me a King Flugabone. That's really cool. Now, I wish I still had that now because they don't make them anymore. Right? <laughs> but, you know, when they got that for me, I'm thinking... That is their version of a trumpet. That is not an upright build instrument. Um, but but so yeah, the, the the high school had Yamaha 321. Um, when I went to the school of music, um, they had um the old Bessons. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was Boykin's music to this day. There was a music store right out outside the gate, like about a block from from the barracks when I was at the school yeah. of music. Not and anymore. they had a best in there, and they had a best in there. It was, an, it was, it was a lacquer one, and I went and I bought it. It was less than a thousand dollars. I don't even remember how I got the money. I probably put it on a credit card or something, you know, being eighteen and stupid. Um, but that was my first horn. Um, the thing played like a dream, but as as I found out when I uh, after I got out of the Marines and went to college and worked with my professor. Um, the thing played about as in tune as a soprano saxophone. The thing could not play in tune with itself. It played beautifully, had a great sound, but we did everything we could to try to make it play in tune. You know, everything from cutting slides to having my shank ground down to have it fit further into the lead pipe. Nothing worked. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I was I was the best in guy at the beginning. Wow, that's incredible. So what kind of metronomes uh did you have that cord tuner metronome set up going? Back in the old days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm so Not old. The that, apps or anything. I'm so old that we didn't even have tuners when I was in high school as far as individual ones. We just had we just had the uh the uh the big the big Sanderson tuners that had the spinning wheels and you had to walk up front mm -hmm. and yeah. go play for it. I, so I you know, tuning as a kid was like, Oh, well, we just get our, we just go in front and get our tuning note before band class. Right. So, and then of course the metronomes were the wind up ones that went tick, tick, tick. And if you sat it on a, on an uneven surface, it would get tick, 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 tick. <laughs> so you would never have a, you know, an, an even beat. So 
so yeah, that those. So really, I just had my plastic wind up Seth Thomas brand metronome, mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. And my, you know, my 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 silver, you know, fold up music stand like they still uh -huh. make. That was it. Uh, that's that's cool. Oh, don't forget the pencil. Yeah, I had a pencil. Yeah, no Apple pencils. You know, <laughs> right? So. Who did you, who was your first, uh, you said the first lesson you took on euphonium was at the school of music. Who's, who's the, uh, who's, who's the euphonium instructor there at that time? That was Dave Duro. Duro. He was the, uh, he had been there probably four or five years before I got there. At that time, when I was at the school, all the, all the faculty there were full, were, were permanent duty. Mm -hmm. so they got there i don't know if it, i don't probably wasn't like that when you got there no. but you got there you spent your whole career there so so my 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 instructor was there for his whole career so he retired from there wow uh, so it's pretty cool yeah uh, it is and now it's like basically you go there for an enlistment and then you move on right so there was really no really no continuity um but hey, I guess things change. Times well, change. They, did. they they eventually went to. Uh, I saw a lot of my uh, fellow bandmates go from Fort Story to Little Creek, and that's a whole different conversation. One that mm -hmm. uh, uh, not very many people get to be uh, privy to. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, um, were there any elements or any any things or principles that? Uh, he imparted on you during his teachings that you can recollect? I just remember him just, just pushing me for excellence. You know, I, I don't remember any fine details other than him just really pushing me and making me work harder and harder each week. I just remember always being challenged with the amount of material that he would assign me each week for lessons. That's all I really remember. You know, I, I mean, I do, I remember we, we worked through, you know, in the Roshu book mm -hmm. and the Terrell book. Um, and, and, uh, you know, of course, you know, you had to do your F1 and F2 solos. All right. For those people that don't know that it's kind of like your midterm and your final. Right. <laughs> what, what did you play for your uh, final? And did you get uh, Charlie? You know, I can't remember what I, I just, I just saw that. Um, <laughs> Gustav Chords. What is it? Concert, concert fantasy, Gustav Chords. I mean, it was a piece that my teacher that Dave DeRoe had selected. And, and oh, that's funny. But uh, yeah, I got a three, three Oh five. It was. So I mean, you got your Charlie. Yeah. It was great for a kid that, had no lessons didn't even know what he was doing as a you know 18 year old i mean right That's i made the, the thrill wall which was cool so <laughs> let's, let's long ago it was still there so it's like that's cool <laughs> so i, I want to kind of uh go over uh some understanding points with the military audition process because what we went through with the school of music is not necessarily what they go through when they make one of the big bands, one of the Charlie bands or one of the, right. you know, the premier bands. It's not the same uh, process of entry. It's not the same process of auditions. Do you want right. to go ahead and describe that process for us? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the easiest way to delineate between the two, between a premier band and bands that are not is that at least in the old days, which is not the case now in the old days, um, people who would win premier band jobs came from colleges and conservatories mm -hmm. almost exclusively. You rarely had high school graduates, although the, the euphonium player that I replaced in the president's own, he won the, his audition at 17. He was, a, he was a freshman at University of Illinois as a 17-year-old, and he won the president's own audition and got the job, and he did one, one, one enlistment sure. and got out. Um, but it was all about, you know, the basically when people get 
to the premier bands, they're already at a level of playing level that is higher than I would say the average college music major that when you you're in school and you kind of sit around and walk through the practice room areas and you hear your, your friends, your co your co-students practicing it and you'll stop and you go, Whoa, man, that's really good. That type of person you, you, you think, Oh, if they decide they're going to be in a premier band and audition, they're probably going to win the job. Now, are there other people that are really fine players in the schools of music? Absolutely. So I think that's the biggest, the the biggest thing is that it's kind of like the 1% of maybe the top 10% that you might have in the school of music. Nowadays, you know, I I see people winning the, you know, the regional, the regional Navy bands, regional Air Force bands, mm-hmm. um, the Army, you know, even going into Army bands. Uh, like Hiram Diaz was in, I think, the Fort Stewart Army band for like a year and a half before he won the president's own right. audition. So it happens. You know, um, and I t- I've told students this for decades that, you know, the the greatest thing as a euphonium player, I think, is to make a living playing euphonium. I, I think that's just so cool. That's I, exactly what we're I, here for, Don. That's exactly. that's what I did. You know, my pretty much my whole adult life was, you know, everything I own has been purchased because I play euphonium. And if you can win a job. And you and I both know if you can handle military life, which isn't always a bed of roses, right? <laughs> you can earn a great living, you know, and move on. Like, you know, I've been retired now for seven years. I don't have to work. I don't need to work. I've got a great retirement because I played euphonium for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but so I've told people, you get a job. Uh, one of one of the graduates from East Carolina that from the Tupa Studio, he'd been in a National Guard band, um, been doing National Guard for the entire time that he's been working on his degree. He auditioned for for one of the Navy bands um, a couple weeks ago, won the job. Right, he's going into Navy. That's awesome. And and he's a he's a great player, a really great player. And I, I guarantee you. If an if an opening comes in DC for the Navy band, and he's still interested, he'll be there someday. But I, I think that's that's the biggest difference right now is, you know, differences in jobs, right? You know, premier bands, you're going to play for the president and for world leaders. You're going to be on TV a lot. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a higher expectation. You know, you you know. You don't, you don't rehearse things a bunch of, you know, you don't have a bunch of rehearsals before you go out and play a White House arrival or a Pentagon arrival. You get your music, you run through it maybe once if you're lucky. And and if it's a different country's national anthem, you blow through it and you get on the bus. And the next time you play it is when you're on TV, you know, so there's that level of preparedness that you may or may not be expected to have in a non premier band that doesn't necessarily mean that those bands don't sound good the the non premier bands even now my son-in-law is uh, an enlisted conduct is the enlisted conductor in the marine band at, at uh, camp lejeune right now the band sounded great i heard a concert a couple of months ago it's like mm-hmm. man i wish paris island band would have sounded that good when i was there <laughs> as a 18 year old I was the like the best player in the band as a as wow. a euphonium player, and that didn't say a whole lot back then, um, because no one practiced, and you know musicians were pretty terrible. Um, but now the level of playing is so it's good that, and I tell people, I say, you know, just because you don't win a premier band job does not mean that you're not good, because you can be a great player and just have a really not so great day, and someone else can have a, a better day than you, and they win. Well, it's really interesting. You you bring up uh, a lot of experiences. Uh, when I was stationed in the 1st Cavalry Division Band, my first gig was playing for President Bush. Mm-hmm. And, and you just never know what you're going to step into as each day progresses. 
right in any military band especially nowadays right uh, yeah it's just incredible to be amongst literally a band of brothers um mm -hmm. and and it's just something I, I wish everybody could experience in some way shape or form in their playing endeavors whether it's you know just the middle school or and or high school or a college or even beyond to make this uh, there's there's no greater enjoyment than to play euphonium and, and play music yep. with a bunch of spectacular musicians around you mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so uh yeah that's that that's that's incredible so when did you start com you talked about all region and solo ensembles did you ever compete in any uh solo competitions while part of the military band system or only only the the itech of 86 um that was right before i won the the president's own audition i i did the 86 itech i i was uh one of one of the solo competition finalists um and then myself and uh another another guy we tied for the uh, mock service band audition um competition at the iTech and that was the only one and then I was a professional you know six months later so right. that was that was it you that's know that's awesome um and I I that was the 86 was the first year of Falcone and I sent the exact tape that I sent into iTech I was accepted as, at iTech but I wasn't accepted at Falcone it was uh, really weird um so so that that was kind of interesting but that's okay I mean I got a job so Teach their own journey. Yeah. And, you know, different sets of ears hear different things and that's fine. But uh, so, yeah, that was the only one. So uh, have you have any of your students, past or present, uh, entered into any competitions? I've had two different students that I've taught um, through high school that have ended up being um finalists in Falcone none of them have ever won but you know they've they've been in Falcone I had one one of my students that I taught through high school he was a finalist in in the president's own one wow. of the president's own auditions um but yeah that's it well then Good, but that's it then, I mean, then, yeah then your uh, tuba student that just landed their job. Right. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Okay. That's awesome. Um, what are three things? Okay. Scales is not part of this. So we already know that scales is going to be part of this. Yeah. What three things did you wish that you would have applied when you first started playing euphonium that you teach your students now? I know scales is number one. Yeah. I think that what I've learned the most is playing smart, not playing hard. Um, there's a fine line between playing too much and, and not playing enough. And everyone is different. Um, and so I, I shudder when, when I, when I hear kids, you know, practicing really loud or you know, like even at the university where, where they're playing in marching band and, and they come to lessons and they're like, man, we're always told we got to play really loud. And, you know, they come into lessons and, and their chops are beat up. And, um, you know, I'm a survivor. I've had three different um, chop injuries in my career that I've had to work through. And, you know, any number of those three should have mm -hmm. like ended my career, but you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to figure out how to adapt and to figure out how to work through them. So I, you know, that, that was, that would be one thing that I would have, you know, that I would stress and try to stress to my students is just take it easy. You know, that rest more than what you do. Don't just constantly hammer something over and over and over again, because as I, I used to joke about this and then it kind of, 
came back to haunt me, but I used to always say, well, you know, every, every set of chops only has so many notes. It's true. It is it's very true. And you never know how many notes your set of chops might have. And so if you take care of your chops, they'll take care of you. How do you, it's just a problem. How do you set them up for success? Those students and those that are watching, what were, what would be the, the, the techniques or tips that you would uh, uh, show them how to sustain their chops? I'd say the first thing there, it's kind of like a, a two, two sides of the same coin on the one side, you know, you'll hear teachers say, don't worry about how it feels, just play. But the other side of the coin is you got to feel how, how it is while if you it's play England, it's you're getting you know i when i look back there's this the injury that i've suffered twice is 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 really called embouchure overuse syndrome eos it's a real problem a lot of professional players have gotten it i've i've gone through it twice um i went i actually went through it when i recorded my cd because i recorded my cd my cd over four days and I just totally obliterated my chops in those four days. I mean, it was like eight hours or longer every day that I was just recording and recording. Um, and, and you know, you find yourself thinking, well, I can just power through this. I've done it before. Because as a professional, you do that. Mm -hmm. You power through. You Sometimes you feel like you're playing on your teeth. And we joke about it. Yeah, man, this was such a long gig. I feel like I'm playing on my teeth. Well, we don't hear ourselves. And then that becomes cumulative where it becomes the overuse and it's, it builds and builds and builds until one day your chops go. Uh -uh. I mean, the last time I got it, as soon as I would start warming up within a, within about a minute, I would develop a blister, a blister on my upper lip. Wow. A blister. Yeah. It would never pop, but it would be a blister. Like you talk about, not a callus, a blister. And it would like swell up to a blister. Wow. And then after I played a while, it would like subside. It would like it would absorb back in, but everything was stiff as could be. So I would, you know, I would just tell students, you have to, you have to be aware of how things feel. If your chops are beat up, you know, if you can take some time off, I, I, I teach my students to take a practice Sabbath. Don't practice seven days a week. I know some some teachers and players will say that's heresy, but take one day off where you don't play. Just take a day off. It's not going to kill you. Right. It's not. It's not going to mess your endurance up or anything. Actually, sometimes... increase it a lot of times. What's that? Uh, taking that time off actually increases that endurance and longevity. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I kind of tell tell students is just to kind of. Be in, and, and as musicians and as mu military musicians, you find yourself being really in tune with your body because when you find yourself out on a really long ceremony, hearing speeches galore, mm -hmm. you know, you're checking all your systems. Do I feel good? Do I feel lightheaded? Am I going to pass out? You know, much less you're feeling your chops. Do my chops feel good? Am I playing on my teeth? You know, so just be aware. You know, like that people always say, you know, be aware of your surroundings, be aware of your chop surroundings. I think that's very important. That's that's incredible. And don't lock those knees, especially for those in marching band right now, because uh, yeah. I have two kids in doing marching band out in the Texas sun right now uh, you go. for that season. Do it right. Man, that's incredible. OK, so what elements have you taken off the horn that have increase your abilities to play like buzzing breathing do you do any singing any vocal exercises i think the one thing that out of out of that list is are just breathing you know i i was around you know when breathing gym came out mm -hmm. i was i've known pat sheridan since the day he walked into the president's zone so he and i've known each other for a long long time and i really bought into the whole breathing book Mm -hmm. um method plus i studied with dave federley who was one of arnold jacobs students and so you know the whole breathing 
thing. Dave, Dave really talked to me about the whole concept of wasting air. Mm -hmm. Never, never trying to make a phrase, never trying to conserve your air because when you conserve your air, intonation suffers and so does your tone, but to waste it. If you run out of air, you breathe again. No one's ever going to get, no one's ever going to make fun of you for breathing a lot, you know, because some of us are tall, some of us are short um, and just breathe. So to me, it's, it's all about using your air. And if we use our air properly, our, our sound will be energized and we'll have that, that sparkle and that zip that, that will be a signature euphonium sound. Like that authentic sound, uh, kind of a, um, a saying from Legend of Beggar Vance, uh, the authentic swing, mm -hmm. finding our authentic sound and not sounding technical, not sounding mechanical or robotic, but mm -hmm. their sound, their true sound. Absolutely. That's, yep. that's great. So that kind of leads right into the next question with phrasing. So uh, in articulation, do you, do you teach a particular practice to increase articulation, phrasing, uh, kind of expand on that a bit? As far as articulation, I, I teach more of a da attack than a ta. Mm -hmm. I have students use use the T consonant first as far, it's when, when we're working on multiple tonguing just to get the syllabic um, idea down and then once they get the coordination down then i say okay now it's time to transition into a more legato smoother attack you know because what young students don't realize is when when we use a two and a coup it, those 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 syllables actually make the air stop when you go tuk, 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 the airstream stops but if you go do go do go do the air continues and so what happens is that becomes a smoother, more pleasant sound when we're articulating quickly. So, so I do that. Um, phrasing, you know, anytime, anytime anyone talks about phrasing, I think more about um, musical phrasing, not having anything to do with breathing, but have every, having everything to do with interpretation. Um, I, I wish that, I wish that, because when I was when I was younger, when I was in high school, band director used to always talk about phrase, make eight bar phrases, make four bar phrases. Right. And then when I when I grew musically, it's like that's totally different. You know, musical phrasing has to do with interpretation of of how to make a phrase come alive, to how to connect it, to how how to make how to make the music go from beat to beat or from from micro beat to micro beat mm -hmm. um so you know again if if it, if we're talking about breathing i just tell my students to breathe where needed but to breathe musically don't breathe you know don't breathe like a knucklehead breathe <laughs> musically make it make sense when you breathe make sure that you breathe in a way that the note you play afterwards ends up sounding like a pickup note to whatever's coming next. Um, you know, we're always told, you know, don't breathe on the bar line. Sometimes we have to, mm -hmm. but whenever possible, if we can breathe, well, we can make that last eighth note or that last quarter note become a pickup note, become an anacrusis to the new, to the new measure, then it actually makes more sense. Indeed. And it's, yeah, precisely. It's just like, um, the ride of the Valkyries for ever since Wagner wrote it. Um, orchestras go dom dim ba dom beam bom beam ba dom beam bom. But the way he really wrote it, it should have been bom beam ba dom be bom beam ba dom be bom beam ba dom be bom beam. But no one plays it that way. That's kind it's of a like beautiful way to do it, but they don't play it that way. Right, like Volsi Fleurs uh, for the Nutcracker mm -hmm. in some instances. That's yes. phenomenal. So going back to your family and your flugelbone story, which is really awesome. When you told them that you're going to audition 
or that you're going to be in the Marine Band at Paris Island, what did they, how did they take that? They, they weren't really supportive of me wanting to be a musician. I'm not sure what they wanted me to do, but I, I vividly remember we lived out in the country. We had six acres of land. And I remember the regular occurrence was when I'd start practicing either, either parent or both would come into my room and say, would you please go outside and practice? It's too loud in here. So here I was growing up in, you know, Jack, outside of Jacksonville, Florida, in the heat and humidity, outside, you know, summer, winter, whatever, out there practicing because it was just too much for them to hear, you know. So I'm not sure what it was. I do know that, you know, that once they got over, once they, well, they never got over me leave, leaving the trumpet, but once, <laughs> I got, once I got into the president's own, then that became their new bragging rights. Then they, they had to tell everyone that, you know, they're, their, their son was in the president's band, as they used to always say that, um, you know, and then when I left, when I left the president's own, then they were like, well, now what are we going to brag about? Because, you know, and so, so then it was, you know, it was never good enough. Right. <laughs> no matter what I did after that, because I wasn't in the, in the president's band anymore, but, you know, it was what it was. Um, but some parents are, are supportive, some aren't. Right. So are you are you seeing support go up with the families that uh, have students in your studio now? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think I think parents I think what I've seen parents are more supportive, um, sometimes to the detriment of their of their children. How sometimes so? I, I think I think parents. Well, I think parents want their children to do a bunch of things because at least before they get to college. I think once they get into college, I think they're fine. But but before you know, yeah, how it is that you know the the parents are worried that if if little Susie and Johnny don't do like five different extracurricular activities, they're not going to look well rounded enough to get into X Y Z university or whatever. Sure. Um, um, and and we found ourselves doing that, but not because of that. We just our our daughter wanted to try everything, and our son just wanted to play baseball until he got into band, and then band was everything. Um, but, uh, but I do, I do believe that parents are more supportive now than they ever were. I totally agree with that. So did any of your, uh, kiddos, uh, play euphonium? No, my son is a percussionist. Um, in fact, he went in the Marine Corps after he graduated, um, with a degree in percussion performance. Um, and then he auditions for Pershing Zone and was in the band with me for my last wow, four that's years. incredible. And I, he and I served together in the same band uh, for four years, and he's still in the band there now. That's awesome. Uh, my daughter has always been a singer. She tried the flute for a little bit, but she was in choir. She was in, she was, um, and uh, she did rifle and flags and all that in marching band, and then did choir in high school. So, yeah, that was the extent of our children's music. So what three, um, are any of your students past or present performing artists or have ever considered or even a frame of mind shift in their, any of their perspectives? I know that's a variant of the question that I had sent you. Yeah. Um, Oddly enough, my my best students, none of them are performing now. It's kind of weird. Hmm. Like one, the one that was a finalist in the president's own audition, he's a music librarian now. Another one became a band director. I'm not sure if he's still directing. And then another one, he's teaching electronic music at a community college now. So it's kind of weird. They're I think the one that's doing electronic music, he's trying to perform as much as he can. He's doing more tuba now than he's doing euphonium, which is interesting. Um, is it my kind of, am I answering what you're looking for? Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, in there's two sides to the coin, right? 
So as far as electronic goes, there's some really amazing stuff that I was just uh, uh, researching yesterday with uh, electronic music uh, played through euphonium and stuff like that. It's really intriguing. Yep. Like what um, Ryan McGeorge is doing. Yeah, 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 especially Ryan McGeorge. Yeah, especially. Um, so, yeah, and the music librarian, there's a position that just opened up. Uh, I want to say with Pershing Zone as a music librarian mm -hmm. uh, just recent, uh, within the last like three years, mm -hmm. I think. That's just incredible. I, I loved being a music librarian in my unit. Um, yeah, I was I was the librarian when I was at Paris Island. Yeah, I, I kind of had fun. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was enjoyable. <laughs> it's wild music away, you know. <laughs> right. We had, put it in the box, stick it on the shelf, you know. Right, and then uh, you had the winger pull out shelves. No, are you kidding? That was the old days. We had wooden shelves, <laughs> cardboard boxes <laughs> with terrible handwriting on the outside. No stickers. So who did the handwriting? Computers, everything was like handwritten on all the all the numbers, library numbers. I mean, I'm, this is like the, the the you know dinosaur age, man. <laughs> right, pre-internet. I'm I'm lucky that the, the euphonium was developed before I before I went into the military. <laughs> I mean, geez. <laughs> well, we could be playing on the Phil Cornell bassos, right? Well, it could be. I think I just barely missed that era, but not by much. Not by much. So uh, when you're teaching sight reading, uh, how how do you implement sight reading into uh, the practice routines of the of your students? I'm I'm a firm believer that sight reading, a good sight reader is someone who understands the language of music. And so I, I believe that the best sight readers can can read any rhythm that is put in front of them. I think a lot of times it's it all comes down to syncopation where, you know, syncopation throws them off. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I auditioned for the Royal Hawaiian Band, Hawaiian music is very syncopated. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the uh, to the sight reading round, there was one tune that like the whole page that I got to was like all syncopated. It was like like there was like one downbeat and then everything was syncopated all the way through. And I got done and I just wanted to say did I get it? Because I mean, it was, it was a tune I didn't know because it was Hawaiian, you know, it had a whole bunch of letters and, you know, a whole bunch of consonants and vowels. I had never, I didn't know anything much about Hawaii, but I think, I think the, the whole idea of syncopation is a problem. What I do with my students is I would just pull out something, an excerpt from my collection and just make them sight read it. And then I'd be like, okay, this is, these are the areas you had problems with. Look at it, figure it out. I want you to play it again and see if you fix those errors. So to me, learning how to sight read is you sight read it. You, the, if you don't have someone telling you what's wrong, you try to figure out, okay, what did I not play correctly? Mentally fix it, start it again, see if you can fix those errors and hopefully not create any more. But, but really, you know, sight reading is an art and it's not taught very often. And, you know, educators, you know, band directors don't really have, well, I I could get my soapbox out. I think they have enough time to teach sight reading, but I, th I think they're just too busy worrying about contests and everything else than actually teaching them how to be musicians. Um, but, you know, and, you know, in, in the studio in the university, you only have so much time. You, right. know, you have 15 lessons every semester, which is not a whole lot to get a lot done. But but you try to teach like there's um, there's a great um, book by Louis Belson that it, um, it's it's a did I write it down did I not write it down it's a it's why, a syncopation. why don't you send it to me after after yeah. it's syncopation studies in four four time but it's like every kind of syncopated study you can do it's written for percussionists but we just use it on you know a fixed pitch turn the metronome on and you just work it and and it gives you like every kind of possible syncopated rhythm you can find and it again it helps you visually orient yourself because again it, you know when you're sight reading it's not about what the rhythms are if you think about it it's it's how the rhythms are laid out geographically within the measure a lot of people don't think about that they think it's beat 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 well yeah but within every beat, just like, especially like with finale now, 
all, all this, all, you know, all the subdivisions are going to be pretty much laid out evenly within that geographically. So you look at the geographical layout of a note. So you of a measure. So you could technically just have the note heads and have them spaced out correctly and not even have the stems and still be able to figure out what the rhythm is. Huh. If you have if you, if you have the meter, you should be able to just read yeah, the note, sure. out, note heads. And so, you know, being able to to learn how how rhythms look within a measure really helps in in your sight reading as well. That that would really test how advanced a a student has become in their progression with sight reading is to see if they've evolved their their logic and reasoning and merged them together to mm -hmm. to really that's incredible. Yeah. I'm, Wow, that's that's really awesome. Um, wow, do you use solfege or the musical notations like with the one two threes? With my with my students, I because they use solfege at the university. I you know when they're when they miss pitches, I'm like, look, sing it. Let's hear it. You just came from sight singing class, and and, and I tell them regularly. I say, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. Because uh -huh. we have sight singing class, we have theory class, we have history class, and then we have private lessons. Well, guess what, people? They're all supposed to be like this, but we teach them as separate entities. And so I tell my students, I say, look, don't just you know sit there and think you hate sight singing class or ear training class. Maybe you do. Use your sight singing class to figure out how to play the right intervals with your music if you're if you're not hitting the right intervals on your solo that you're working on or your roshu or your etude, maybe you should play the first note on your horn or play the first note on the piano in the practice room and try to figure it out solfege wise. So I think it's I think we've learned it backwards. You know, we, we we're not taught solfege most of us until we get to college. After we've spent years playing an instrument, you know. Unless we're kids are fortunate enough to do, you know, to to have, you know, some really great um, elementary music programs, right? You know, like Orf and Kodai and stuff like that, where they they learn solfege and learn how to do it. But I think even if they when they learn it, it's dropped by the wayside once they pick up an instrument because then the string teachers and the band directors they don't they don't teach it. They don't pick up where they left off, and they should, right? I mean. Again, they would say they don't have enough time, but I, I believe that, I mean, my, my whole doctoral dissertation was on, you know, beginning band methods for euphonium and beginning band methods, um, beginning studio methods for euphonium. And, and a lot of this stuff, it's deficient. A lot of the band methods are deficient. And if it's deficient for euphonium, it's deficient for every instrument that's in the beginning band. And, and if kids aren't taught properly, if they're not taught to use their ears, if they're not taught solid rhythmic figures, how how do we expect them to become successful? We can't just beat it into them so that they go to contest and get ones. Well, that, great, but that doesn't make them into musicians, right? You know, that makes them into machines that have a heart, a pulse. You know, so but that's my soapbox. No, that's 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 very valid because I mean, with what we're bringing to the table with Farm for Dreams, this Euphonium Summit and the ability to display and showcase your journey and all those that have contributed to this endeavor is to show that it is so much, po it's so possible to earn a living, not just earn a living, but be viable and and more than sustainable in life and being able mm -hmm. to do what you love and not be forced to, you know, do what everybody else wants you to do, do what you want to do. Exactly. And that's, that's too, you know, when you, I used to always get mad at people before I was a college professor, you know, when I was a performer, I would get mad at professors. Like, why do you let so many people become performance majors? Why they're not getting jobs. But now that I've been on the other side, I realize that number one, people have dreams. And who would who would I who am I 
to tell a student, well, you may never get a job. Well, I should tell them that. And I do, you know, you may never get a job, but it's not my right. It's not my position, not my time to tell them, you know, you may not get a job. Maybe you should just major in something else because they're going to get a degree and they're going to find their way and they're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, they may take a, you know, a diagonal move, a lateral kind of move in music and still be in music, or they might play in a community band and be an engineer and can afford to buy every euphonium that they'd ever want. Right. Um, so, so yeah, let people pursue their dreams and, and, you know, if, if they want to make a living, like you say, they can do it. They just have to be really creative. Absolutely. Right? And being part of this overall contribute contribution for the summit is showcasing all those different facets that these students can take advantage of or even come up with something so brilliant, something so new that it blows us all out of the water, which would be phenomenal. It really Absolutely. would. Yeah. It really yeah. would. So do you... Um, when did you start teaching others how to play euphonium? Um, that would be when I was in college. So after after my time in Paris Island. So when I was working on my bachelor's, um, that's when I first started teaching them. I felt I felt like I was I was I knew enough to not be dangerous, but you know, figured I knew just enough to be able to teach kids because they didn't know as much as I did. But uh <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I damaged any, any young students. I don't think I told them anything wrong. I just didn't, you know, know as much as I know now, but yeah. So and I, I encourage, I encourage um, even high school students, as long as they're not going to try to mess with, you know, embouchures or anything else, go ahead, teach, teach middle schoolers. It, Cause like I've, I tell people, you learn more as a teacher from your students, then a lot of times when you learn from books or anything else, I've learned more from all of my students over the years than I've learned from my teachers, which is really interesting. And I'm sure they learned from me. Um, so yeah, it, it's good. It's good. It keeps us, keeps us fresh. current and fresh. Yeah. Absolutely. So talking about training and stuff like that, have you have you picked up or do you utilize any type of resistance training? You know, I, the only resistance training I have ever used was the old school burp. I don't even know if they still make them. Yeah. Um, I have one floating. Yep. I've got mine right here. Yep. I've got mine somewhere in my, uh, in my music parts bin with mouthpieces and everything. I've used it for a while. I, I, I will say that I'm, you know, between the buzzing is terrible camp and the buzzing is great camp, I'm kind of in the middle where I feel like a little bit of buzzing is okay, but not good, especially, you know, coming from the injuries I've had, um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, if, if, a, if a student buzzes too much, they can do more damage than good. And, you know, even like with the flow partner or some of these other things, I think, Anytime you're you're taking the mouthpiece out of the horn, you're 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 changing the embouchure inside the rim ever so slightly, and so we have to be careful. I mean, I'm I'm no physiologist, but but I mean it's the case. I mean, because I mean you know for for every kid that you can that can buzz on a mouthpiece a young kid there are other kids that just can't make a buzz on a mouthpiece but yet they put the mouthpiece in the horn and they can play so so something goes on you know when we're when we're buzzing and when we're you know doing some kind of resistance things i know i think it's a preference thing more than anything else when i studied with art layman who was in my in my opinion one of the greatest euphonium players that ever lived when i studied with him he was totally against buzzing he never buzzed a mouthpiece. Wow. Um, never suggested buzzing, never did it. Um, never taught about it, never spoke about it. Um, but yet, you know, there are other players that that buzz and think it's appropriate. 
You know, I think it's it's good for spot checking. If you're having a, a response issue, take the mouthpiece out, buzz that note, put it back in, try to play that passage that the note didn't speak. It'll probably speak and then move on. But I, but I don't, you know, I just don't believe in the excessive, that's not a good word, but the, I think less less is more on the buzzing, you know, outside of the lead pipe. That's me. Other people hmm. would differ. Um, huh. that's a great perspective though i, I didn't uh didn't know he was such a strickler of not buzzing yeah it, it was shocking to me because at that time i was i was kind of more adamant on the buzzing right <laughs> Younger, i was a young knucklehead <laughs> well yeah this we'll have to uh i have some uh interesting ideas and uh personal uh personal things with the buzzing uh, that I would love to um, discuss with you further, maybe not on this, uh, <laughs> maybe on a future summit or so. Um, so what opportunity, uh, we've talked about opportunities for future euphonium students, uh, even those that are going through um, your program and programs throughout the nation, the globe, for that matter, uh, the, to take advantage of what, what, would be some of the highlight programs or opportunities that uh, to make or to kind of put the feelers out for the families, the students that are just starting out their journey or that, that are halfway through high school um, that may not, uh, may not know about uh, certain competitions or opportunities. Besides the ones that we've already discussed, well, I think probably the 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 best thing they can do is is find a, a good local teacher, and sometimes that's hard, especially with euphonium. You know, it's not like you can find a euphonium teacher on every corner, like you might find a trumpet teacher or a violin teacher or a flute teacher. You can kind of see I don't like trumpet players because um, I'm still recovering, um, <laughs> but but I think I think that's the key is you know, if parents don't have a clue, then, you know, as far as what's out there for, for their children to be involved in, um, I think, you know, that that's a shame. I mean, just because, just because they get involved in beginning band, I mean, that's obviously a good start, but that still doesn't give them the knowledge of, you know, well, you know, there's this organization that can help or, you know, there are these competitions or, you know, these solo competitions or these camps, you know, it, it's, it's so hard. So I think, I think the, the teacher, the private teacher is really the, the person where the buck stops. It's, it's kind of their responsibility, you know, the, for, to give the, the parent and the student, you know, this full menu of things of here are all the opportunities that you could possibly choose from knock yourself out right i mean a lot a lot of these i know my parents had no clue on right. stuff for euphonium or music in general uh even even my you know the the time my band directors had there wasn't enough time to discuss any opportunities besides hey you can go to college you know you can possibly get a full ride um mm -hmm. that was about it yeah that was about it uh, now so much more. I will say I want to kind of take a okay, to take a little detour here because I, to me it's 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 an issue that's close to my heart and I wish, you know, kind of one of those things. So many of us wish if we had it to do all over again, we would do it. Is encourage young kids, even euphonium players, to somehow learn how to improvise. Um, I have a, I have a student that I still teach online from Hawaii and a uh, euphonium student. And she really wanted to be in jazz band. And I told her, I said, you just need to go to your band director and say, I I'd like to play in jazz band, but I just want to play euphonium. And what did she do the next week? She tell me, oh, Mr. So-and-so gave me a trombone. I'm like, okay, I get it. As a euphonium player, you kind of really somewhat need to learn how to play trombone. I did. I play, I gigged on trombone when I was in college. But 
it, look, no one, no one's really going to care. I mean, who was it? Stan Kenton used tubas in the big band. Who cares? But but to give kids the opportunity to learn how to improvise, because if a kid can learn how to improvise, they can they'll end up being able to play anything. Mm -hmm. And most euphonium players, most of us can't play anything. We can play something if it's put on a stand and it's got little black dots in on the paper. Right. But if you put alphabets, you know, put letters of the alphabet mm -hmm. above the ledger lines with no dots, we don't know what to do with it. Or what we do with it is not very good. It causes much laughing by our colleagues that are jazzers. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I I remember this day to this day when I was at Paris Island, I had a really good friend of mine who was um, an MOS bassoon player, but he was actually a tenor sax player, a wow. really great jazz sax player. One day we were in the band hall and he had his sax out and he goes, okay, hey, come here, get your horn. So I went, got my horn and, you know, back in the old days when we had, you know, record players and he put on a Jamie Abersol. Yeah, record. Abersol. I was just going to talk and, about Abersol. Yeah. And he goes, all right, play. I'm like, what do I play? He goes, just play along. And we did it for about 15 minutes. He goes, you know, if you just do this a little bit every day, you know, you, you could do really well. And I looked at him, I said, I don't have time for this. I'm going to be in the president's own. I tell you, I, I, I can, I can hear that conversation as if it happened yesterday. And that happened like in 1981. Wow. And, and I think about that almost on a weekly basis about if I would have just said, you know, I could have spared 15 minutes a day. But I didn't. And and I think about Ryan McGeorge, who at one point when he got to the president's own, there, there were no there were no people, no no wind players that could improvise. And he and he raised his hand, he goes, I'll do it. And they're like, You're a euphonium player. He goes, No, I'll bring my my valve trombone. So he would go to the White House and play jazz combo gigs on his valve trombone. No one knew the difference. Right. Here's a euphonium player playing in the White House jazz combo gigs because he could improvise. The rest of the make, section couldn't improvise. And could. make it and make it look like he was a trombone player. Look and sound legitimate. So you know, legitimate. I, I think if, if yeah, if kids if kids would just, but you know, it's it's a culture change. Band directors need to to be taught that it's okay to let. You know, yeah, I mean, it's it's okay for euphonium players to learn how to play trombone, but but don't don't say, oh, you're going to learn how to play jazz and you're going to learn it on a new instrument. Let them learn how to play jazz on the instrument they've been playing for the last two or three years. Don't don't hit them between the eyes with a whole bunch of new stuff. Um, so, I mean, that's my biggest regret in my life. You know, is that I didn't do that as a young person. Um, and you know, knowing knowing the time that it takes to to develop something like that, if you do it when you're a young person, you could at least be conversant enough to sound decent. Right. That was you actually know? one of the last. That was the one of the very last questions. Oh, good. I nailed uh, it. Uh, yeah, you sure did. That was actually the next question. Um, something that was made tr had a tremendous impact on you, um, which a big regret will definitely leave a tremendous impact on your heart and, and yeah. how you, how you live the rest of what we have here on this, our next note, right. Mm -hmm. will have tremendous impact on our next note. Yep. Um, what uh, you, you mentioned the uh, Louis Belson uh, syncopation studies. What other like books would you, and since we were just talking about improv the Jamie Abersall books, uh, mm -hmm. even the intro to uh, improv uh, comes with a CD and stuff like that. And I think they have uh, um, Spotify downloads and stuff like that. You can. Uh, yeah, there's a really great free app called, I think it's free called IB Real. Um, and it's, it's an app that has a ton of um, um, improv tracks already. And you have the ability to, like 
make your own, you know, like you can, you know, do your own, you know, 12 bar blues things or, you know, sambas or any, any style you want. You can set the style, you can set the key, you can put repeats in it. Uh, it's a cool. great tool. Um, and, and so you, you can do that. And, you know, I, I, I've used that for my students. Like when we, when they started, you know, working on their minor scales, you know, I'll, you know, I'll put the, the, you know, like Dorian, you know, I'd, I'd put like a minor, I'd have like the, like a minor blues going on or something like that while they're, so that while they're practicing their minor scales, it's just not, you know, they actually have, they can hear harmonic things going on, you know, so you can do stuff like that. I think that's a really good, a good tool to use. And even someone that's not a jazzer like me to at least help them hear, be able to hear the harmony um, when they're doing these scales. You become more aware. You're, yeah. you're tuning their awareness. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So just a side note, if a player could read one book that you'd recommend to start with right now, where they're at from current to beginners to, you know, those that watch this later on down the road, what would that book be? What would be your go-to book? My go-to book. Sound in Motion. Sound and Motion. Remember, I put it. Yep. Sound and Motion, a performer's guide to great, greater musical expression by David McGill. David McGill. Awesome. He's the uh, he's the principal uh, principal bassoon in the uh, Chicago Symphony. Uh, that's awesome. Um, it's, it's the greatest book I've ever read on on playing musical. It's it's so good. It's just really good. I reference it regularly to my with my students, but uh, he just really lays out, you know, how how musicians should and do play music, and and how how to interpret things. You know, when you get a p new piece of music and you look at it and you go, "Uh oh, what do I do with this?" It gives you tools on on trying to figure out, well, what do I do with this? Okay, oh, now I can. Now I can interpret this better. I can make the phrasing much better and it'll actually come alive. Um, it's it's based on the, I'm sorry. And, and and then how to adapt that into what you're doing with other pieces. Right. So, so David McGill, he studied with John Delancey, who was a student of Marcel Tabato. Oh, wow. So it's based on the whole Tabato system of musical interpretation and phrasing. Um, and so it's just that, that, that musical line from Tabato. And it's it's a really, just a really powerful way of learning how to make music come alive instead of just playing notes and rhythms that so many people do. They just play notes and rhythms and there's just so much more to it. They don't make the music come alive. You know, we might, we might play an, an occasional crescendo and that's about it. But um for all practical purposes, we sound just like a living, breathing computer playing music instead of trying to make things come alive. So that's a really great book. That's incredible. That's incredible. So one more question about books. What are the, besides that book being one of your top five, what other, what other books have impacted you? Top tones for the trumpeter. I hate to use the trumpet, trumpet word. That's, that's a really, really great book. For building endurance and also the upper register, but mainly just endurance, um, by by Walter Smith. Just just a great great book. Um, I've used it over the years. Of course, the Charlier Etudes. Those you know, of course, these are for advanced advanced players. For beginners, the Walter Beeler Book One. That is by far the best uh, studio euphonium or studio trombone beginning book that one can use that was part of my study and it it pretty much blew the rubank beginning book out out of the water um and so you know those are good um if you want a fun book it's the 15 caprices for for a trombone with f attachment by Rodet. yeah that thing is crazy fun it is um, it irritates university students but hey that's okay get them out of their that's comfort zone that's right. Yeah. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? You got a fourth valve, you use it. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It's Indeed. not there for decoration, right? I mean, it's right. there to be 
depressed, you know. Now, now uh, put them on a, one of the old kings and get that pinky going. Yeah, see how strong that pinky is. Right. Not, uh, <laughs> That's what I started on. <laughs> that king I bet, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was a beast. Oh, man. Well, thank you so much for participating, contributing uh, to the Euphonium Summit and being part of the inspiration that that just is needs to be shown and showcased throughout the world on not only just euphonium but music in general and if we can showcase euphonium first i'm all for it <laughs> absolutely yeah but thank you so much and uh uh, until next time, I have uh, I can't wait to interview you again about some other things that we'll discuss really soon. Sounds like fun. Okay, awesome.